you have your Bible today and you'd open it with me to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Beginning at verse 23, we're going to read today through verse number 28. I know y'all can't see the screen behind me today because the camera view is so tight, but uh, I've put the text up there as I always do. <laughs> Amen. Matthew 23, verses 23 through 28. And the King James text today reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which train at a gnat and swallow a camel, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within Ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, To thine own self be true. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, how we love you, how grateful we are, God, today, for the plan of salvation which declares to all the world, Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Lord, I'm so glad that although I was raised in a church pew, I'm so glad that one day in my self-hatred, my self-loathing, my self-condemnation, one day I came to understand that whosoever meaneth me. Glory to God. Lord, there are none who are ex excluded. If we can believe and obey the wondrous gospel of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to be saved, to become born again, to live for God, and to make heaven. Master, anoint today the speaker. This message needs so much to be spoken. But Lord, even more than it needs to be voiced, it needs to be heard. And therefore, God, I ask that you would unstop the ears of everyone who today at this moment would be listening and watching by reason of the internet. Allow our ears to be open, our spiritual hearts to be awake and alert. Our spirit today, O oh God, to be hungry for the word of God. Let that which I declare be thus saith the Lord. Anoint today your humble servant. That the people of God might be blessed. That they might be nourished. That Lord they might be edified. For that is the purpose of the word of God today. We ask it all in none other than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. To thine own self be true. You may recall that in Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth, Shakespeare's 
renowned play. This line is something that we hear. The words are spoken to thine own self be true. You know, there is nothing more gratifying and more wonderful in this life than being able to live your reality. Than being able to have an outside that matches your inside. And being able to live apart from the sin and the sickness that is hypocrisy. I'm going to have to stay close to the pulpit today or I'll get out of camera view. So I'm going to, it's going to be hard for me. I'm used to wandering a little bit. Amen. But I want to tell you today, hypocrisy is something that the Lord despised and hated. He spoke on the topic of hypocrisy more than on virtually any other sin any other conduct or behavior. Hypocrisy was something the Lord addressed frequently, and why would it not? Why would hypocrisy not bother God when hypocrisy is something that in many instances can only be seen by God? Because men, the Word of God say, look, tells us, look upon the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. So therefore, men can only see what we put forth. They can only see the facade, the image that we set before them. They're not able to see the intent of our heart. But God looks upon us, and as God looks upon us, it's as though Superman, if you'll pardon my using this illustration. It's as though Superman is using his x-ray vision and he never sees your clothes. He never sees your skin. He can't tell if you're dirty or clean. He can't tell if you're rich or poor. He doesn't see your jewelry lady. He doesn't see your makeup ma'am. He doesn't see your haircut mister. No, he looks beyond all that and he sees what's going on in the deepest part of your soul. In the heart of man. Recently I took my vehicle to a car wash. I'm one of those people. I like to keep my car clean. Man looks on the outward appearance after all. <laughs> and therefore a, a filthy, dirty, muddy car doesn't shine well on the driver. But I took it to be cleaned and... Uh, it was my pickup truck, and it was just a mess on the inside. I mean, it, it needed vacuuming. It needed a good clean, you know. The windows needed to be washed. So I spent $45 to have a local uh, car wash, and they offered detailing options, and I had them vacuum it and clean the, uh, the inside and wash all the glass, you know and everything. Well, I had to sit off to the side by uh, the vacuums where the people go through the, to the car wash and then they pull up, you know, and they vacuum their own cars. And mine's across the way and I've got a fella doing it for me. And uh, he's doing all the cleaning. I'm sitting there next to the vacuums, you know, and Tommy, I saw all these people pulling up to them vacuums having just gone through the car wash. And their cars are beat to pot. I mean, <laughs> their cars are messed up. They, they got dents and bumpers missing and they got paint peeling and faded. And I mean, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know why they even bother. If my car looked as bad as all that, I just wouldn't even bother messing with keeping it clean and trying to clean it up inside or outside. And boy, I mean, some of them fellas, they're in there vacuuming the inside of this junker, you know, and, and they're cleaning up the inside of that junker. And I'm watching these people, and now I'm sitting there for quite a while, and I get to see quite a lot of people come in. Some of the people come, they got pretty nice cars, they're in good shape, they're pretty cars, you know. I understand them 
taken the time to clean it and vacuum it and do all this stuff. But them other people, I just don't understand. And you know, as God often does, He uses life circumstances of this nature to kind of rebuke me a little bit. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord kind of spoke to my heart and said, Shouldn't we all be mindful to keep the inside clean regardless of what people see on the outside? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I thought, Lord, thank you, Lord. I can't even sit in judgment of somebody vacuuming their junker. But I've got to hear from heaven. And the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, You know, you got to remember, the inside of that car is where those people live. That's where they see. That's what they're having to look at. Every time they get in that car, that's what they're having to see. The outside of the car may reflect on them, but the inside is where they're at. If you have any pride in yourself at all. It doesn't matter how many hits you've taken in life. It doesn't matter how often you've been through the grinder. It doesn't matter how rough and tumble you look on the outside. Isn't it important that we work to keep the inside clean? Amen. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you, these people weren't trying to be hypocrites. They weren't trying to project something on the outside that they didn't have on the inside. No, they were doing just the opposite. They were working on the inside regardless of what it appeared on the outside. I'm going to tell you a little secret. There are a lot of people in our world today. There are a lot of people in the church today that look at yours and my outside. Yeah. They see who we are. They see, oh, that's an LGBT person. Well, bless God, they haven't got a right. They haven't got any business even trying to go to church. They haven't got any business trying to live for God. I don't know why they even bother. Their old car is garbage. It's junk. It's filthy. And I tell the truth. Yep. But they see us going to church and getting the outside washed. They don't see us working on our inside. Because you know what, lady? You know what, mister? You can be as hateful and as homophobic and as foolish and as asinine as you want to be. I'm going to do everything in my power to live the Christian life the way the Christian life was meant to be lived. Amen. I'm going to work on the inside. I don't care what you see on the outside. I don't care what things you view outside externally. I don't care how you think they reflect on me. It doesn't matter at all. I've made up my mind I'm going to live for God. I've made up my mind I'm going to do this thing the way that God meant for it to be done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to give them 100%. I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul. And I'm going to do His commandments to the best of my limited, weak, sinful, frail human condition. But I'm not going to try to look good to you not going to put on an act so that I look like something to you that I'm not just so you'll accept me and you'll approve of me. There are too many people in the church. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 23. There are too many people in the church spend all their time washing and waxing the outside, making sure that the image they put forth uh, fits in and conforms with the group that they're part of. Oh, you're part of the UPC. So, lady, you keep your hair long. You keep jewelry from your body. You don't wear makeup. You wear long sleeves and long dresses. And you always got your stockings on straight. But you're malicious. You're a gossiper. You're a backbiter. You don't even love your own children the way that God 
has ordained that a mother love her own children. Oh, my Lord, Pastor. Whew, you're putting it on thick today. I'm putting it on thick because I know people that fit that description. The Word of God tells parents to love their children. As parents, we represent to our children God. We are representatives of God. Therefore, we are to love them as the Lord loves them. Does not the Word of God say, Fathers, love your children? Does the Word of God not tell us that mothers are to love their children? Uh, why is this? Because you are the first exposure that any child has to the love of God. Does not the Word of God tell husbands, love your wives? Listen, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Isn't that what it says? So what does that tell us? That tells us that all of our relationships on this earth, every one of them, is supposed to be lived in such a manner that the observer, or the person, excuse me, the person with whom we are in relationship, is able to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. They're supposed to be able to see Jesus in us and through us. They're supposed to be able to experience the love of God, the unconditional grace of God. How? Simply by reason of their experience with us. Therefore, parents, you are called to love your children in an unconditional manner, even as God loves His children in an unconditional manner. The Word of God said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, isn't that funny? The Word of God does not say, if we confess our sins, that He will lessen the punishment for that sin. Think about it for a minute. The Word of God does not say that God will still hold us accountable for that sin. However, He will lessen the degree of punishment. That's not what the Word of God said. It said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means when we come to God and confess our sin, God not only forgives it, but He cleanses it. He wipes it away. We start all over with a brand new clean slate. I remember as a kid, I think most kids, now maybe I'm wrong, maybe I was a psycho or something and I don't know. I think most kids, when you're young, you kind of have a fascination with fire, you know, and things like that. Well, my grandfather smoked like a chimney, and he was constantly lighting cigarettes back in the day with uh, matches, you know. Well, I was just, I don't know how old I was, pretty, pretty young, seven, eight, something like that. And my grandfather left a pack of matches around, and I grabbed hold of them. And all I wanted to do was strike that match and see the flame, you know, look at the fire. That's really, that's all I wanted to do. So I went into the bathroom, my grandparents' bathroom. We were at my grandparents' house. And I went into their bathroom, and I sat there, and I just lit a couple of them matches up and looked at the fire on it and thought, wow, isn't that cool? Isn't that neat? And all you got to do is rub this against that, and poof, magic, here comes fire. Well, after a while, I think my grandfather got to looking for his matches and he couldn't find them, you know, because I had taken them. And of course, my grandfather, when something like that happened, he had a hissy fit. And he'd be yelling and screaming because he knew where he put everything and everything had to be in its place. And bless God, nobody better mess with it. Well, then on top of that, my mother happened to smell the smell of lit matches in the bathroom. When she went in the bathroom, she came out and said, somebody been playing with matches because I sure do smell something. 
And I'll never forget this as long as I live. Mom, you may have forgotten this ages ago. But I'll never forget this. I just, somehow or another, the Holy Ghost just spoke to my heart. I was just young. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, You know, you need to be honest and you need to tell your mother you did this. You need to confess it. Don't you lie. Don't you say, even as a child, I, there were times I really wrestled with doing the right thing. You know, I went to church. I heard the preacher say that Christians don't lie and God doesn't like it when we lie. So I decided this time, boy, I was going to buck up and I was going to be as brave as I could brave. And I told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm going to be honest and, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I took them and, and I lit a couple of them in the bathroom. And my mother said, well, that's very good. I'm glad you chose to be honest and you didn't lie to me. Now I'm going to whip you because you had no business playing with them matches. And I still got a couple of wax. Now, Mother, don't feel bad how many parents do this. Most parents do this. But do you know what the lesson I just learned was? Lying is smart. Confession is stupid. Did you hear what I said? Lying is not the way, I mean, lying's the way to go. Telling the truth is not the way to go. Because telling the truth did not prevent me from any punishment. Do you follow what I'm saying? Here I was terrified to tell the truth. I went against everything in me to be honest and to confess my sin. And lo and behold, I still got a licking. I'm going to tell you a little secret today, folks. And I don't say this, you know, again, my, my mother did what most parents did. Amen, Tommy, your parents probably did the same thing, right? Well, we still have to punish you. We still have to. Well, then what in the world is the good of me coming forth and being honest and being truthful if you still got to punish me? Well, let me ask you a question today. If we raised our children to come to us and to acknowledge when they have done wrong, without our having to find them out or to expose their wrongdoing, and we responded to them with forgiveness, provided they commit to not reenacting that bad behavior. Don't you think our children would learn the unconditional love and forgiveness of God? Don't you think that that would demonstrate to our kids how God approaches us? Do you follow what I'm telling you today? You see, we breed hypocrisy. I'm having the devil of a time trying to stay behind the pulpit. <laughs> we breed hypocrisy into our own children because we basically tell them as long as things on the outside look right, then all is well with the world. Doesn't matter what's going on in the end. Now we say, oh no, I, don't, I didn't teach my children that. I was trying to teach my children that the outside and the inside should be the same. That they should behave and that they shouldn't be doing these bad things. Yeah, but the way we respond to the bad things has an effect on how they then turn around and translate that and say, all right, is it wise? Is it smart? Does it work for me then to confess my sin? Amen. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Is it wise for me to do that? Or is it wiser for me to project one thing on the outside, although I know internally that's not at all what the truth is? Oh my goodness, hypocrisy is all about living one thing in the sight of others while all the while what's going on within us is entirely different. I had a preacher that I've known for many, many, many years. He contacted me online. He sent me an email. 
And uh, apparently he had been following our ministry for a while. And I did not know. Frankly, I heard rumors, but I did not know. Uh, he confessed to me that he too is gay. And he was telling me some stuff in his email about his pensions or his appetites, who he likes and what kind of people he likes to be with and blah, blah, blah. And honestly, I found the email to be nasty. I found it to be offensive. I found it to be disgusting. And I was very disappointed in this gentleman. Very disappointed. I thought, okay, I understand you're gay. That, that part I'm, I'm okay with, but I do have a problem with this you said, that you said, the other thing you said. You know what I'm saying? And the way he went about saying it, and apparently uh, he also mentioned something to the effect of he was doing a lot of drinking these days and all this, and he was still in the closet. He still, his family still didn't know, so he asked me to be careful, you know, not to see anything to me. I wouldn't really see any of his family or anything or anybody that would know him even for that matter, so far as I know. But anyway, and I told him, I wrote him back and I said, listen, it's obvious to me that you need restoration and you need help. You need some support. I said, and I'm happy to be there for you every way I possibly can. For all the stuff I read that offended me, for all the stuff I read that I was troubled by, I did not want to respond to him in a negative fashion. I did not want to respond to him with a single word of condemnation. I didn't want to become a guilt monger, you know. So I was careful to respond to him in love. I was careful to offer him my hand in terms of restoration and help. And he even said something about coming to preach for us sometime. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. After the garbage that just come off of your pen, you're telling me you're offering to come preach for me? No, I believe a Christian lives like a Christian, whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. And it's obvious to me that you've fallen away and you've backslidden. And you know. So anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to offer him restorative words and positive words. And I continue to communicate with him for months afterwards. One day on my Facebook during the 2016 presidential campaign, I posted something concerning a certain candidate who is disgusting and evil and vile and racist and uh, narcissistic and wicked beyond any candidate I've ever seen for President of the United States. And I posted something concerning this individual and all of a sudden this man posted something in response to what I had posted. And you need to wake up, and you need to realize, and boy, he just, and I immediately recognized, oh, here's the posturing, so that anybody who knows him, that anybody who's familiar with him, is going to realize, oh, look at brother so-and-so, boy, he sure is towing the line. He sure is holy. He sure is right with God. He sure, because he was talking the same garbage that all these other fundamentalists and evangelical preachers are talking. Now I'm going to tell you, you want to see me get mad? Oh, I got, I got some kind of mad. I didn't get mad because he had become an alcoholic and was struggling with alcohol addiction. I didn't become angry because... He talked vulgar and nasty and used some horrible language and said some disgusting things. None of those things angered me, but I'll tell you what did anger me. It angered me when I saw this fool who's so deep in a closet he can't even see the crack of light under the door. It angered me when I saw him trying to put forth an image of one thing 
when in reality he's living so much the opposite of that it's not even funny. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That aggravated me. That hypocrisy aggravated me. You know what? If you want to live in a closet, live in a closet. But don't you dare come out and speak words of condemnation against gay, lesbian people. Don't you dare come out of, and speak negative, condemnatory things toward LGBT causes. Just because you're wrestling with your personal identity and you're struggling with your sexual orientation, don't you dare put forth like you are a heterosexual, uh, perfect Christian who has every right to stand in opposition to and in condemnation of these people. We know that most people, according to studies, who struggle with their sexual identity and their sexual orientation, especially as it relates to their walk with God, we know that almost without fail, those are the people who condemn it the hardest. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Those are the people who preach against it. Though, and I'll never forget Jimmy Swagger years ago. Never forget it. That man, every time he preached, he talked about prostitutes. I never heard a preacher talk about prostitutes more than Jimmy Swagger. Every time he'd be talking about you know, the poor sinner, the poor and all, and the prostitute. And, and, and I thought, my God, that man sure has prostitute on the brain. Well, we found out as time went on, the reason he had prostitute on the brain is because he had a prostitute on the payroll. Preachers who preach against gay, lesbian people and gay, lesbian causes, I guarantee you there's a reason why those issues are so important and so high on their list. They're trying to preach and purge something out of themselves. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But in the process of doing this, you become a vile, disgusting, offensive to God hypocrite. I wrestled with some things when I first came back to God and came back to the church. I had led, I've talked about this many times before, I had led a number of things out of the bag. I'd allowed myself to do a whole lot of things when I was out of church for those few years. And I'm going to tell you, it was hard to get back in control of myself so that I wasn't allowing myself to do all these things. And there were some things, Tommy, long before I met you, there were some things that I still was doing that I should not have been doing. But I knew it was wrong. And you want to know something? I was praying that God would help me to get it under control. And you want to know something else? I wouldn't dare preach against it. I wouldn't dare introduce an element of condemnation or guilt in someone else's life when I myself was dealing with that exact same issue. Do you understand what I'm telling you? You see, I knew that I'm not a hypocrite as long as I'm wrestling with this issue. That doesn't make you a hypocrite. What makes you a hypocrite is when you try to project one thing and in reality on the inside you're living something different. Do you understand what I'm telling you? So therefore, knowing God despises hypocrisy, I just kept my mouth shut when it comes to certain issues uh, early on in my ministry. If you go way back and look at sermons I preached in 1993 and 94, 95, there are certain things I, I didn't talk about. Not because I, I still talked about we need to do our best to live right. We, you know what I'm saying? But I, I was smart enough not to put myself in the hypocrite column. I didn't want to be in the hypocrite column. Hypocrisy is a strange state of being. It involves our privately knowing what the inside really looks like. Although all the while we're trying to maintain a false front and an upright appearance in hopes of making others believe 
that we are in fact something that we are not. Anyone who has ever lived in the closet knows how tumultuous and painful and how great a struggle it can be to maintain the appearances of one life while in reality living a very different life in secret. Am I telling the truth? But living in a closet is not in and of itself hypocritical. Why? Because one's private life is theirs to keep private. There's nothing hypocritical about keeping your private life private. There's nothing hypocritical about that. But if one's life, excuse me, if one lives their life in the closet, speaking and acting as though they oppose and detest, all things LGBT, then the line has been crossed and the spirit of hypocrisy has reared its hateful head. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? That's when hypocrisy comes into play. When we begin to try to project one thing when we know good and well we're living something different. In Psalm 32 and verse 5, the writer of Psalms, we believe it to be David, the psalmist king, wrote, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. In Psalm 69 and verse 5, the word of the Lord tells us, O God, Thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from Thee. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, a portion of Scripture many of us are familiar with, But the Lord saith unto Samuel, when Samuel went to the house of Jesse, and God was using him to anoint the future king over Israel to replace Saul. Samuel saw Jesse's sons. He saw these handsome, tall, giant men, strong and powerful. Boy, I'll tell you, they've got the look of a king. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God's choice for future king was a little scrawny boy who was still out in the fields tending after his father's flocks, and I tell him the truth. But that was God's pick. Why? Because David had a heart that was after God. Amen. The word of God said David was a man, the Lord said, after mine own heart. David wanted God's things. David wanted to do things God's way. Now the question is, was David perfect? <laughs> Not by a stretch. Was David sinless? Not by a mile. Was David uh, the most righteous man that ever walked? Is he the most righteous king that ever served over Israel? Not in the least. But his heart was right. <sighs> I'm going to tell you, living honestly before the Lord is the only way to live. I came out in May of 1989. Uh, eight, uh, 1980, good Lord, 89. It's been an awful long time now since I made that decision. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Here's how I came out to my family. I didn't go to my grandmother, my mother, anybody and say, hi, I want to have a talk with you. I want to tell you, i, I got to explain something that, you know, I'm gay. Blah, blah, blah. I didn't do that. I decided I'm going to live my truth. I'm going to live my reality. And if I'm going to live my reality, I'm going to live it openly. I'm going to live it honestly. I'm not going to try to hide nothing. And if people put two and two together and realize something, then so be it. And if they ask me, I'll tell them. So I began to go to establishments that, you know, uh, catered to the LGBT community and what have you. I began to meet people. I began to go out and 
date and that sort of thing. And I'd bring friends and people I was dating by my grandparents' house because my mother was living in Texas at the time. And all of a sudden, my grandmother see me with these people and she knows they're a certain way. So therefore, you know, it's like, and then after a while, she said, CJ, you got something to tell me? I said, no, I ain't got nothing to tell you. I said, but if you figured something out, then so be it. I'm not going to live in a closet. I'm not going to live a lie. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. That is something, folks, I'm going to tell you, that's, that's one of my biggest problems in life. It is so hard for me to try to, to not be in reality what uh, I project and let me tell you, when I falter in private, and I do or say something in private, and I'm sad to say it happens way more often than I care for it to be, and it doesn't quite match up to the standard that I hold for myself, I don't justify myself in it. I'm going to tell you right now, I feel bad about it, and I say, Lord, forgive me, God help me. You know, I get so mad about this Trump business, and I, you know, I, I get so upset. I'm going to tell you, folks, oh, Lord Jesus, I have a struggle going on right now. But I learned after coming out in 1989 that living honestly before the Lord is the only way to live. Well, how can you live honestly before the Lord? Well, I'll tell you how you do that. You live your outside and your inside the same. Because if you're living your inside before the Lord and you're living your outside before men differently, that does not please God. That's hypocrisy. Therefore, you're not living before the Lord. He sees what's inside anyway. And our secrets cannot be hidden from Him. So when we seek to put up a false front and manufacture a false image, we are doing so for the benefit of men, not God. Am I telling the truth? God has instructed His people to live transparently, being honest and open about our struggles and our weaknesses, our faults and our failings. Ooh. In James chapter 5, verse 16, James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So God has instructed His people to live transparently, being honest and open about our struggles, our weaknesses, our faults, our sins. Try that in most churches and see how long you remain a member. You'll be lucky if they don't kick you out on your ear, disfellowship you. Come on now, am I telling the truth? In some churches, I, I know of LGBT people who literally got beaten by church members, by fellow members of the church, including the pastor. When I came out, uh, when, when a circumstance occurred before I came out that indicated I was struggling with the gay issue, I had a Pentecostal preacher say the most hateful, nasty, mean things to me I'd ever heard in my life. He used the F word more than in, in a matter of a sentence than I did in my lifetime. But God's instructed us to live our lives openly and honestly, transparently. This would be possible if believers walked as we ought to walk. Free of judgment, if we abstained from ridicule, gossip, condemnation, and malice, as the Word of God teaches us. And I tell the truth, if we walked, if the church walked as it's meant to walk, people could come into the church, stand up in a testimony and say, I'm struggling with alcohol. I have a problem with alcohol. I, I've been struggling with this. We have somebody who is part of our church, uh, not locally, but you know, an extended member of our church. And this individual came to me and told me this, you know, and expressed this. And I said, we'll be praying with you, honey. We're behind you 100%. You see, that's the way the church is meant to operate. We're supposed to be able to confess our faults one unto another. And the only response to that ought to be, pray one for another that ye may be healed. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. 
In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, condemn him and throw him out of the church and disfellowship him. No. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We see somebody else struggling. We see somebody else having a hard time. We're not supposed to jump up on the burden on their back and jump up and down on it and make it even harder for them to live for God, make it even harder for them to stay in the church, make it even harder for them to do the right thing. No, we're supposed to get up under the burden and help them bear it. Am I telling the truth? Right. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, Oh, hypocrisy. He deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. We're not supposed to worry about everybody else's walk with God. We're not supposed to worry about how the other child of God is doing things. Am I telling the truth? All we're supposed to do is be there available to help because in the end we're all going to answer for ourselves. Am I telling the truth today? Almost done. Romans 12, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul once again writes, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. If we would only remember, you, you can't come against, you can't condemn, you can't criticize the other child of God, because like it or not, honey, they're part of the same body you're a part of. If they're sick, if they're diseased, if they're troubled, that doesn't suddenly make them not part of the body. No, they're still part of the body. So what should be your only response to them? It should be positive. It should be constructive. It should be restorative, am I telling the truth today? But in order for this to occur, for the body to function as it's meant to body... Uh, to function. We have to live openly. We have to live honestly. We have to be able to follow the mandate of Scripture and be honest about what's happening. I mentioned earlier that we teach our children to be hypocritical when we fail to encourage honesty and we punish them. When they come forward in the same way we would have punished them had they kept their transgression secret. And we simply found it out. I'm going to tell you something. Churches do the same thing. They push people into a hypocritical life. The more rules you create, I'll never forget, Teddy Roosevelt, former president of the United States, when they were talking about prohibition and all this, I believe it was Teddy Roosevelt who made the comment, the only thing that more laws create is more criminals. You can create all the rules you want to. You can create all the laws you want to. All the standards you want to. The only thing you're going to create is more hypocrites. Because people are going to do everything in their power. They're still going to do those things, but they're going to do it, and they're going to try to set forth an image that they're not doing them. Am I telling the truth? You can outlaw homosexuality in America tomorrow. I've got news for you, dummy. You're not going to get rid of gay, lesbian people. They'll go back into secret. They'll go back underground. They'll go back into uh, being in the closet. But they're still going to exist. Nothing's going to change. The only thing you create with more laws is more criminals. Am I telling the truth today? We've got to be careful about how we deal with people. We've got to be careful. We don't want to create an atmosphere that breeds hypocrisy. Hypocrisy offends God. We read of closeted individuals in the Word of God. 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Nicodemus was a disciple of Christ, but he was a secret disciple. He kept his belief in and his following the Lord a secret. That's why he crept in to talk to the Lord at night when nobody else was paying attention and nobody else was watching. We read of another in John 19 verse 38. After the crucifixion of the Lord and after this Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus but secretly for the fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. These are two men who followed the Lord, but they didn't dare profess it. They didn't dare let anyone know that they were in fact a disciple and a follower of Christ. But you know, you can't be a Christian. You can't say, well, I know a surefire way to stay from being a hypocrite, I just won't tell anybody I'm a Christian. That way, whatever mistakes I make, uh, nobody be any the wiser. That doesn't work because God has laid it out that things be done differently. And I'm trying to end today. Luke 12, 1 through 9. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness, that shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Interesting for those who claim hell is not real. The Lord said, after you did, this guy's got the power to cast you into hell. But I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Now listen. Again I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So guess what? You don't have an out. You're not able to say, well, I just won't tell anybody I'm a Christian. And that way, whatever I do on the outside uh, doesn't matter. Oh, no, no, no. The problem is, the Lord says, we've got to confess Him before men. Oh, my goodness. Well, that immediately puts us in a whole different ballgame, doesn't it? That immediately puts our responsibility in a different place. That puts us in a position where we become answerable for our outside matching up with our inside. Lastly, today in 1 John 3, 19 through 23, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments, and do those things that are pleasing 
in his sight. And this is his commandment. Now I want to remind you, I preached a message quite a while back. And I talked about the fact that there was only one commandment Jesus ever gave. That he said, this is my commandment. Singular, right? Listen to this. John writes, and this is his commandment. Singular. That we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ. And love one another as he gave us commandment. Say, Pastor, you're going to end the message on to thine own self be true with the need for Christians to love one another. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'll tell you why. Because in order for people to be able to live a life free of hypocrisy, in order for people to be able to do what they're supposed to do as a child of God, and in order for people not to feel the need to try to be something on the outside that they're not on the inside. We have to do our part. We have to love like we're supposed to love. Amen? We're not supposed to be critics. We're not supposed to be judges. We're not supposed to be condemning and criticizing and finding fault. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to be restoring we're supposed to be reconciling. That's what this ministry is all about, isn't it? Amen. And Tommy, you know, you know as well as anybody knows, we've had people come through this church that had all kinds of issues. I mean, we've had some people that I'll tell you, as a pastor, they tried my patience. They, about the minute you thought they made a, a step of progress in the right direction, you saw they were going three steps backwards. Am I telling the truth? There were some folks we've had that were part of our church for years and years. Not just for months, not just for a year or two, but for several years. And this pastor in this church, and this pastor instructed this church, Let's be patient. Let's be kind. Let's be constructive. Did I not? Let's be reconciled. Let's do all in our power. Listen, you can't win the race if you're not in it. That person's never going to cross the finish line if we push them out. Am I telling the truth? So that's been the approach of this ministry since day one. And I've got news for you today. That's the way God wants every church in every community everywhere to approach this thing because he has called us today to thine own self be true be able to look in a mirror and your heart not condemn you because you know that what you see in that mirror is the same thing that God sees am I telling the truth today amen would you stand with me this afternoon I hope this message was a blessing and an encouragement to you today. I apologize again that we're running...